Good afternoon, and welcome to a special edition of Mind Matters, a free community education program presented by the Mind Center at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. My name is Kathy Van Cleve, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here at the Mind Center. We've all heard a lot of buzz about COVID-19 and that since the pandemic began more than a year ago. Now that the COVID vaccines are available, how do you determine whether they're safe and effective? Studies show that while Black and Hispanic Americans are infected with COVID at two to three times the rate of white Americans, the vaccination rate for persons of color is still significantly lower than white Americans. During this presentation, Dr. Shipley, Dr. Pierre, and Dr. Udemba will discuss common questions and misconceptions about the COVID-19 vaccines and clarify what is truth and what is myth. Our special guests today include Dr. Chikozi Udemba, Dr. Ardarian Pierre, and Dr. Shanya Shl Sonia Shl Shl Shipley. Excuse me, my goodness. Dr. Chikozi Udemba is the Director of the Office of Health Equity with the Mississippi State Department of Health. Dr. Udemba is currently serving as the co-lead for the COVID-19 Health Equity Response Unit in the state. This unit is focused on addressing issues related to COVID-19 in minority communities around the state. Dr. Ardarian Pierre earned her doctorate degree of medicine at the American University of Antigua, New York. In 2015, she joined the University of Mississippi Medical Center as a geriatric fellow and the UMMC faculty as an assistant professor of family medicine. In addition, she provides diagnosis and treatment for patients in the Mind Center Clinic. Dr. Sonia Shipley earned her Doctorate of Medicine degree from the University of Mississippi School of Medicine. Dr. Shipley has two offices in Mississippi at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and Baptist Medical Center, where she specializes in family medicine. Dr. Shipley provides comprehensive medical care and is generally the first point of contact for patients seeking general care. She also provides diagnosis and treatment for patients in the Mind Center Clinic and is the primary provider for their telemedicine program called Telemind. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chikozi Udemba, Dr. Ardarian Pierre, and Dr. Sonia Shipley. Dr. Udemba, we'll turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, and so, I think it's really important as we have this discussion to really kind of look at um, how do we get here, uh, especially when we talk about transitioning over time. And we know that we've been dealing with COVID-19 for over a year now. And so I'm pretty sure everybody's COVID out, um, whether you're working with COVID-19 or you have to, to deal with it from your day to day with trying to monitor different things as well as trying to be safe in your communities. And so, you know, starting from March 11th up until April 1st, we've had over 305,000 cases in the state um, and over 7,051 deaths. And so we know that it's, um, it's, it's been real and it's actually been affecting our communities. Early on, it was a huge um, deal for our black and brown communities um, as we were suffering at a, uh, at a higher rate. We we're starting to see more of a, a better balance and we kind of touch on that as we move through this presentation. But we know that this is um, something that has um, uh, really exacerbated some of our hard to reach uh, communities, our rural communities, as well as some of our um, specific uh, vulnerable populations as well. And so we'll transition to the next side, looking at again, we started off in March um, and, and we looked from year, from year 2020 to March, 2021, you can see how it has affected um, and how it's progressed over time. Um, primarily we've had two spikes. Um, the first spike happening over in July of 2020, and we call that our 4th of July spike, um, where basically we just saw a huge influx of uh, new cases around the 4th of July holiday. Um, it really got started in May after Memorial Day holiday. And then of course, over the summer, when people got further and further out and doing more things and comfortable and relaxed, we saw that huge spike. And we did a lot of work around education, testing, you know, social distancing and all those different things. And we were able to drive that number back down and then we had another holiday season and we call, we call that the holiday season spike right there where you have Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's that just created a major influx right there in that November, December, January area where we saw the worst uh, of the actual virus within our state during that time. Um, hospitalizations were, were extremely high. 
Um, we were at basically at a crisis level when we talked about hospitalization access to ICU and hospital beds across the state, as well as we did see an increase in a number of deaths and, and um, new cases and, and the rate was just increased over time. And so um, through hard work and some other different things, especially with the introduction of vaccinations in, um, in the state, we're starting to see that number decline um, over time and where we are now. So transitioning into that overall, um, for the most part, for those individuals that contract the virus, um, most individuals do not have to go to the hospital. Most of those individuals do um, recover at home. But uh, for a virus like this, 10.7% of those individuals end up in a hospital. That's a really high rate for, for a virus. Um, you don't really see that for some of our other viruses like pneumonia and, and flu and things like that. So, that. so that's something that's of concern because we know that's a major stress on the hospital system, knowing that a lot of people go to hospitals for other reasons, all right? So we have people in long stays in the hospital for coronavirus, that means that's less availability for individuals that come in for any types of accidents or violent crimes or things like that. So if somebody falls off a horse, uh, off a horse if they have an injury with an, on a form, if they, there's um, cardiac arrest or heart attack or anything like that, those beds are already um, taken up. And then it also creates a dangerous situation for those individuals that are coming in for, let's say, a stroke. Um, there are um, also putting, exposing themselves for possible being contaminated with the virus and that exacerbates the whole situation as well. And so we know that it's really important that we uh, monitor that. And so comparing to where we were in November, we saw that hospitalization rate steadily increasing. And we, we saw it get pretty high in January. Um, but now looking at it from March up to April, we're seeing a steady decline and it's a significant decline where again, we're, we started out in 308 and now we're averaging around 190 so um, folks that are being hospitalized. Um, we have also seeing the decrease in patients in ICU and people that are on ventilators. So it's a really positive sign that this is working and the efforts that are going forward in trying to reduce the spread of um, COVID-19 is, is um, taking effect and showing up in our hospitals. And so that's a really good sign. And so when we look at it overall from age groups, uh, we know um, that the biggest group that is um, actually affected by new cases is going to be that 25 to 39 year olds. Now we're also starting to see we started to see a huge increase in 18 to 24. Early on, uh, the primary groups that we were seeing were, were that 40 to 49 and 50 to 64 that working age group. And then over time, um, our younger age group started to, uh, to pick up. So we see a lot of those cases are in those that younger group. But the issue in comparison is if we look at that, um, we look at the red um, bars, those are the individuals that are actually um, dying from COVID-19. And we see that the group that is most affected by that are those that are 65 and older. And so that's really key and important. And that's why um, that decision of who gets the vaccine first really was based on who's most affected severely by this. And so when you look at over time, yes, these younger, the younger population were, um, receiving more new cases, but the actual deaths that were occurring in our communities were uh, our older populations. And so that's really important in some of those decision-making as well. And so when we look at disparities over time, um, and this is just to look at the cases. Um, so early on, if you look at the left, that was in July of 2020, 55% um, of those in new cases that were occurring in the state were in African-Americans. Um, and so that's a major deal when you look at the African American population that's in the state, it's roughly around 38% or less. And so when you're looking at data like this, you want to see um, the data follow the actual makeup of the population size within the state. So if there's only 38% of Black folks in Mississippi, only 38% of them should make up this, this pie chart. And the same thing for our other um, ethnic groups. So 5.8% of uh, new cases were uh, Hispanics, um, where we know Hispanics are less than 30% in our state, and, and so on for the, some of the, our other special populations. Now, if we look at it here in March 20, um, 2021, we're seeing that those disparities are, have been reduced um, significantly, and it's starting to favor more so uh, our actual population size and population makeup for the state, where you, you see 38% um, is African-Americans, 3.2% is Hispanics, even though it's still relatively high, but it's closer. But the um, concerning part um, is, of course, our other population and then um, our American Indian population were still relatively higher than what we would like it to be. And so when we look at deaths, it's, this, it's kind of the same um, thing where we're looking at, um, again, it was 47%. We see a re reduction 
for um, the black community, community where it's down to 4.1 percent, we start. We also see a reduction in our Hispanic community as well. And so um, there's been some progress in both deaths and um, new cases, but we still have some work to do to address those disparity issues. And again, we want this to follow more so the population makeup of our state. And so that's why it's important that whenever there's preventive measures like vaccines, social distancing, wearing masks, that we um, address that to our special populations and our most vulnerable populations, which are our black and brown communities across the state. And so when we're, when we're looking at this and um, really wanted to highlight what it looks like for um, across genders. And so uh, primarily early on, what we saw was that um, cases, um, more women were um, diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 than men. And that was the, um, the same across all um, races. Uh, and there's some significant differences, not necessarily against um, races, but against genders. Um, and then, but then when you look at it for deaths, they're relatively at the same rate. And so for there to be a significant less amount of men that were new cases than women, it's concerning that more men were dying from COVID-19 than women. And there's a lot of different um, theories of why that may be, mainly because, you know, the whole idea that men don't like to go to doctors, they don't, they don't follow what they need to do. Um, we're not understanding, uh, we don't do our annual checkups, we don't even know what our, our um, chronic disease underlying health conditions may be and so on and so forth. And that may have led to some of these different things. But again, um, those are different things that we have to work through as a state and agency, especially for our, our pre, uh, people of color to really kind of address those disparities so that, um, again, we don't continue to see this trend occurring and um, exacerbating over time. And so, and, uh, we're looking at that um, same kind of deal where now it's, again, those disparity issues are have been addressed over time. So in that last slide, we saw that African-Americans were kind of the, the big um, group, which is the bottom group, that weighted group. And now um, over to, um, in 2021, we're starting to see again that, that, um, that the data is starting to match the actual population size where we know we have more white men and women in the state than you know other populations. And so this actually shows that we're making some progress on racial disparities, but there's still some issues on um, our gender disparities that exist. Um, and it's still concerning because we don't want to see as many women um, having um, new cases of COVID-19, but also we don't want to see as many men dying as well. So there's two kind of issues that we're really trying to address. One is how do we protect um, our, our communities and family members from getting COVID-19? Because uh, the best um, treatment is prevention. And so we want to stop that um, case from happening. But then also on the converse side, where we know that pe some people are just going to get the virus, how do we, again, address those disparities against those gender issues um, from those individuals that are going to be severely ill and or dying from this disease? And so one of the, the key things um, that we always discuss about this are underlying health conditions. And the key top um, health condition that we look at is hypertension. Hypertension has been really the, 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 the biggest link to um, severe illness in the state. So uh, for a lot of those individuals that are dying in our state from COVID-19, they have hypertension and as their underlying health call, um, condition. The other key important thing is that there is a coupling of some of these things. So some of these individuals have hypertension and diabetes, which then increases their risk of having severe illness and or dying from this disease. And so again, that was important for the thought process of how do we roll this out to the community? All right, and so if if, um, if those of you that were keeping up with the rollout, you know, of course, first it was um, those individuals that were 75 and up, then it was 65 and up, then it was individuals with underlying health conditions and those 50 and up with underlying health conditions. And the thought process of that, of opening up to in individuals that have health conditions is this chart right here, where we're seeing that so many people that are dying from COVID-19 have these underlying health conditions where it's hypertension, um, any type of other cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you know, lung disease. And um, one of the key things that people ask questions about was obesity. And obesity is technically an underlying health condition for a lot of these different things, mainly because it is a risk factor for a lot of those other conditions, whether it's neurological conditions, as well as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. And so it's really key and important to understand um, that piece when we're talking about fairness and understanding why we rolled it out um, as a state um, in the way that we did. 
Okay. And so I want to wrap up um, to, to in this on this slide where we're talking about where we are and what we've been able to do uh, with the vaccines. And so sorry those, that the numbers are, are so low, but what I want to show is on, on the um, table on your left, um, where we're at 717,000 vaccines um, administered or doses administered. And in a month's time, we were, uh, we were able to go over 2 million vaccines administered. So there's been a lot of work to really try to get this out. Uh, early on, access was a major issue. Access was a huge issue for a lot of different folks. Um, when you talk about 75 and up and how many individuals that just did not have the capacity to utilize a computer and, and sign up for appointments online, or for those individuals that don't have access to computers or family members that can do it for them, um, utilizing the call center and having um, to wait long waits on the call to, in order to book your appointment. And in other parts where it was just different communities where they just did not have a provider in their community um, or transportation to go to a site. So a lot of those different things we've been trying to address um, in, in these different ways. And we see over time, we've been able to increase our, um, our, our vaccinations from uh, disparities as well. So um, early on, it was 63%. And in a, mo a month's time, 63% of those that were receiving vaccines were white, 25% uh, were black. And in a month's time, we've been able to see that increase up to around 30% of black people getting, getting vaccinated. Um, in our state. And that was mainly because we were addressing vaccination issues. We have a program where we're doing community vaccine um, events in communities where people don't have to travel and we're bringing the vaccines to them. And so that solves the vaccine issue. The other issue that we have to solve is in uh, making sure that people understand um, the safety as well as trying to uh, address any type of hesitancies that occur in our various communities, whether um, it's a black community and mistrust, or if it's the Hispanic community as well as mistrust, but in a different way, whether it's um, their, their mistrust of being able, being deported or and so on and so forth and all those different things when we talk about immigrants and things of that nature. And so um, there's a lot of work to be done and it's, um, it's, it takes the entire community to work on this, not just the, the health department, not just um, UMC, is not, not just you know, um, healthcare providers, but also the community members getting information out there, but also being willing to go out there and, and not only protect yourself, but just your family and your community as well. And so I'll wrap up there and then I'm handing back over to Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Odembo. We appreciate you sharing such wonderful information. And it's great to see those trends shift and to be uh, more uh, like our, our population centers. I'll turn it over to Dr. Shipley and Dr. Pierre. Hi, good afternoon. I am Dr. Pierre and I am absolutely elated to share with you today. Um, so most people have serious concerns about the COVID-19 vaccination or vaccinations. And just to be transparent with you, so did I. I had to make this thing personal as a mother, as a wife, as a sister, as a daughter, as a physician and leader in the community, I had to sit down and make informed decisions, do my research and know that the quality of these vaccinations are where they should be for us to indeed protect our community. So views on getting a COVID-19 vaccine among adults aged 50 to 80, 20% would like to get it as soon as possible. 46% would like to get it but wait until others receive it. 20% are unsure about getting it at all. And again, that is why we are here to help you make an informed decision. 14% said, hey, I don't want it. I'm not interested in getting it. So uh, as we go through the presentation, we want to touch upon some of the legends, rumors, uh, stories you may have heard circulating out in the world, uh, social media posts, what have you. We want to address some of those concerns today and, and provide some accurate, best information to help you protect yourself, protect your families, and to help us all protect each other. So, one thing floating around is the rush to get these vaccines approved makes them less safe. However, that is not the case. The FDA 
is using the, the same standards that it has used for decades. There have been no shortcuts taken whatsoever in ensuring the safety of these vaccines. Nothing has been skipped. Uh, in fact, there are two very important committees. Uh, you'll see the acronyms there, the VRPAC and the ACIP. And those committees are comprised of various uh, scientists, physicians, stakeholders, uh, folks who have a vested interest in keeping everybody safe. And so the whole process has been vetted all along. So that myth is busted. Busted. <laughs> All right. So no one knows how long vaccine protection will last. That is one of the concerns. So most of the vaccines are two doses taken 21 days or 28 days apart, three to four weeks. Protection is near 95% within two weeks after the second dose. So we do want to stress that you will not be fully protected until you have received your second dose of the vaccine and then two weeks after that second dose. The vaccination appears to be longer lasting than natural immunity. We do not know yet how long or whether booster shots will be needed. Again, there, there is still a lot of research that is underway and we are learning a lot day by day. Another urban legend. I can stop wearing a mask two weeks after taking the second dose of the vaccine. That is not true, friends and family. The CDC still recommends wearing a mask after vaccination. Our vaccines are fantastic. They are fantastic. When it comes to preventing severe illness, hospitalization, death, they are fantastic. This is as good as it gets as far as a vaccine is concerned. It's as good as it gets, but it's not 100%. And so it still behooves us to wear our masks uh, socially distance as we possible so that we can try to prevent uh, transmission to other individuals. And I'm sure you guys have probably heard that there are some new variants that are circulating as well. And so um, they're still undergoing research or, or ongoing research to determine just how effective uh, vaccination will be uh, as far as combating their, those variants. And the initial evidence at least suggests that there is some degree of protection. But again, it's not uh, on the magnitude of 95%. It may be more like 50% uh, based on some of that initial data. And so, um, so we still have to be vigilant. We still have to be on our guard uh, to do all the things that we have been doing from the very beginning. Um, our community transmission rates are still high. They're still high. Uh, we're doing a ton of testing, of course, but uh, not every single person who may potentially have COVID gets tested. So I'm sure we are missing people. And so again, let's just stay vigilant. Let's wash those hands, use that hand sanitizer, wear those masks, socially distance, and, and try to continue to uh, keep each other safe. The other thing to think about as well is that um, even though you get the vaccine, it may still be possible to transmit the virus to other people uh, if you do get sick. There's ongoing research, again, looking at this, um, looking at uh, asymptomatic virus, even though you've been vaccinated, um, but we don't have all that information yet. So again, stay vigilant, wear your mask. <laughs> Another myth busted. <laughs> All right, so there is a chance. So another myth, there is another chance that you can get the virus from the vaccine. So there's not even a chance, not on a boat, not on a plane as listed here. There's no complete virus in the vaccine. So only messenger RNA fragments, and this does not become a part of your DNA. It kind of works to help your body 
um, recognize COVID-19 if it were introduced and be able to fight and prepare, recognize it and, and build an immune system, immune response to it. So you may have symptoms very similar to COVID-19, but again, the vaccine does not give you COVID-19. You could already be infected with COVID-19 when you take the vaccine or get infected between doses. So if you were to experience any symptoms around the time of being vaccinated or before your second dose or even up to two weeks after your second dose, again, you could have been um, exposed to the virus prior to you being um, immunized. It is possible that the mRNA in the vaccine could change your DNA. So our cells contain many mRNA fragments uh, for various proteins. So basically our body uses that mRNA to make things. However, the mRNA that's in the vaccine does not go into the center of the cell where your actual DNA lives. So it is not possible for that uh, mRNA to change that area of your cells because it just doesn't go there. Um, and so our DNA uh, will take that mRNA and subsequently make proteins and then the fragments will stay in the cell, of course, where they were injected, but then the body just breaks that down uh, very, very quickly. Um, so the DNA takes the mRNA, the mRNA will make a protein, and then the after that protein is made, the presence of that protein is what allows the body to mount that immune response. So... In other words, this is not true that receiving an mRNA vaccine could change your DNA. And I wanted to just briefly mention the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it is a different type of vaccine. It is an adenovirus vaccine, um, but it's the same thing. It will not alter your body on a cellular level. Basically, it is a virus that has been disabled and it is just being used as a way to get things where they need to go inside of the body. And so same thing, it is inactivated, so it cannot make you sick. Um, we have other live virus vaccines, for example, um, like our chicken pox vaccine, for example. Um, so in certain situations where people have very, very compromised immune systems, we don't let them get those vaccines because those vaccines can give you the disease. But for this vaccine, though, our very immunocompromised patients can actually consider getting this vaccine because it's inactivated and it can't make you sick. All right. So to dispel another myth. You should still get the vaccine if, even if you have had COVID-19. So the virus does provide some natural immunity for at least three months for most people. So if you've heard or if you've had COVID-19 and you've heard um, the specialists say wait 90 days, it is because it is thought that we have a natural immunity for up to about 90 days. A number of people have shown convincing evidence for reinfection, all right? So the vaccination appears to be longer lasting than natural immunity. So if you get the vaccine, um, we, we expect it to last longer than, than 90 days. CDC recommends, again, waiting 90 days because you likely have natural immunity for that length of time. Oh, this is a favorite. There is a microchip, some nanotechnology in the vaccine that may be used to track you. This is Nora. Nora has a chip, but we can't track Nora. The chip is sort of big. If the government wants to track us, 
they have much easier ways to do it other than developing multi-trillion dollar nanotechnology to inject into your bloodstream. You have a very easy tracking device on you at all times, probably. It's called a cell phone. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 vaccination is not a method by which the government is trying to track any of us. If you are truly worried, turn off your phone. My husband's a sheriff's deputy. He said, if you stick it in a Pop-Tart wrapper, the foil is supposed to block the signal. I don't know how true that is, but if you care, turn it off and stick it in a Pop-Tart wrapper. All right, so we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine. So side effects of the vaccine normally occur within six weeks. The most serious side effects occur within the first 30 minutes or so. No deaths have been attributed to the vaccine to date. So at this point in time, we haven't had any patients um, to, to pass away from receiving the vaccination. Over 550,000 deaths in the United States alone have been related to COVID-19. So if we are balancing risk versus benefits of the vaccine, the balance sways far in favor of the vaccine. And again, especially for people of color who are at least 1.5 or more times likely to get this disease and or succumb to it. Another urban legend, the vaccine could cause infertility in women of childbearing age. There is no known link between these vaccines and infertility. There were 12 women in the Pfizer trial, six women in the Moderna trial who got pregnant after receiving the vaccines. And that pregnancy rate was exactly the same as women who got the placebo. So as women who didn't get the vaccine at all, there was no difference. Women have become pregnant after being infected with the COVID-19 vaccine. So again, this is a rumor. This is a myth. It is absolutely not true. Busted. <laughs> so just to discuss tips for caregivers during COVID-19 and maintaining a level of function. Get outdoors and exercise to the extent possible. So do what you can, but get outside, get busy, get moving. Practice indoor exercising, sit to stand, Tai Chi, dance, get creative, ask your support system for ideas, go for a drive or a picnic, assist with virtual connections to family and friends. And I know I've had a ton of family and friends who are actually having virtual family reunions, which I've it's amazing how creative they've gotten with this. Find specific ways that others can contribute and take calculated risks that support what is most important. Um, just getting better. So additional tips, specifically when your loved one is in long-term care. So Communicate with the facilities often. This pandemic has shown us that our policies, our procedures change from day to day and moment to moment. And so maintaining that regular communication simply helps you stay abreast and uh, keeps you apprised of just how much contact and interaction you will be able to maintain with your loved one. Also, make sure your emergency contact information is incorrect because should they need to reach you, uh, we don't want there to be a delay just because they don't have the right phone number or email. Also, um, ask the facility about alternate ways to connect with your loved one. So can you, uh, you know, do extra phone calls, video chat, emails, letters? If your loved one can't communicate, then specifically ask the facility about how you can get updates. And of course, we know even if they can't talk to you, you can still talk to them. So ask the facility as far as, um, you know, 
doing some sort of FaceTime or what have you so your loved one can hear your voice and still know that you are there and that you are involved in their care. Um, also discuss or provide written information um, about your loved one's wishes in the event of serious illness, um, including COVID, obviously. All right, and so for additional tips to support caregivers, ask for ways that you can ease the burden um, and kind of provide respite or a break for them. They may need ideas for how you can help, whether that's picking up groceries, preparing a, a meal, leaving it at the doorstep. Listen carefully for quiet asks. So pay attention to what is needed and what ways you may be able to nurture these caregivers. Respect their responses. If they say no, thank you, respect it and offer again, another day, another time. Encourage and help them to care for themselves. Lastly, offer to talk through difficult end of life decisions and listen more than you speak. Call or visit safely and or often. Even if you have to wave from the window, it does make a difference. It does touch your heart. It does provide support. Thank you. Ladies, we have uh, our, just a, a wonderful team here, and we do have a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to ask you to address. While we're doing yeah. that, there are some auxiliary resources, too, that I'll pull back up um, for view after, um, after the question. The question uh, from uh, an RN here states that they heard the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccines will provide immunity for six months. Uh, can you discuss that? So at this point, the duration of immunity is still being studied. The kind of the last um, word we've sort of heard is that six month mark might be reasonable. So as such, the makers of all of the vaccines are actually at this point looking into developing booster doses. So Officially, we're not 100% sure. We think that number is probably reasonable. And as such, they are working on boosters. Excellent point. Are there any other questions for our panelists today? I saw someone put, what about the Johnson & Johnson one dose shot vaccine? I'm not sure the exact question about that one specifically. I don't know if the poster wanted I, to clarify I you, anything. I think you addressed it um, in, okay. the, in, in the, the course of the of the presentation. Okay, perfect. Um, but the the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, as I understand it, is a single dose vaccine. That's correct. And uh, it's been made available um, to other communities. I actually, have a neighbor who chose that particular vaccine for their family because that's what worked for them. And so again, that um, even with the the single dose vaccine, as I understand it, it does take, um, what, 28 days for it to be, um, for, for you to, for it to kind of take it, go into effect. So similar to the, those first doses of the other vaccines. So um, the question, the next question here is, uh, how often will we uh, have to take a booster? I'll let you all address that. So we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the boosters have not been developed they are working on them at this time. And so I could easily envision COVID vaccination becoming something akin to flu vaccination where you probably will realistically need yearly boosters is, is what I'm envisioning. That is not based on any scientific research at this point, this is based on what I know about how viruses behave and mutate over time. And so, um, so I, I suspect boosters will be a yearly thing, but like I said, that is not official evidence or guidance. We are still waiting to hear what is recommended once those tools are developed. 
Another uh, question, and I've heard this as well, is what do you say to people who don't trust the vaccine development process? And I think we covered this earlier in, in the presentation, but if you can summarize that for us. And I think slide number two, the, the second, second or third slide of your sections covered that. Um, basically, the, the standards, uh, and I can pull mm -hmm. that slide if, if that might make yes. it a little bit easier to review since we're not. Um, so in general, as we stated, right. no, there were no steps skipped in developing right. vaccination. So although, um, you know, this, you know, we heard the terms warp speed, warp speed, it was faster than normal, but all steps, all of the research, all of the clinical trials were thorough and complete uh, for the vaccination to be used for emergency use. Yeah, and, and to, to add to that, one of the key things that I, I don't think people uh, realize or know about this was that uh, this was based on um, basically biomedical science that occurred before this. So they've been working on mRNA vaccines for over 20 years. And so the overall science in, it, in itself has already been tested and researched over time. The only thing that has been different and specific for this is that they used it for a, a specific virus, uh, which is the COVID-19 virus. But even then, they've been doing um, research on COVID um, or coronavirus, um, other types of strains of coronavirus previously, as far as vaccinations are concerned. So this is not necessarily that something that they just cooked up over a couple of months. It's a lot of research that has happened scientifically in general around mRNA vaccines and, and so on and so forth. And this, this, this warp speed part is really just more so of us getting access to the community for a, a specific vaccine for COVID-19. Excellent point. Uh, we have two questions that are they're somewhat together. Um, since there are multiple COVID variants out there now, will the current vaccines help fight against them or will other vaccines need to be created? The other question that goes to that is how uh, effective are the current vaccines against the different variants? So I, I pulled some um, data yesterday um, about this and not to sound like a broken record, but I want to be completely transparent about what we know and the information we currently have about effectiveness um, against variants is limited. Um, so specifically, um, the data I have for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine said that the efficacy was similar in all regions and countries, including South Africa and Brazil, 72% efficacy in the US, 68% Brazil, 64% in South Africa, uh, where 95% of cases were um, variants. Um, based on though the best available data we have at this time, we really can't make any broad generalizations as far as activity against variants. It's also challenging to remark upon the effectiveness of mRNA vaccines against variants because they were developed at a time where we didn't have the variants circulating. And so that data, I firmly believe will be coming down the pipeline as we study and learn more and more. It's just not available at this time. Um, since Johnson & Johnson was developed while variants were circulating, though, we do have some data about its effectiveness against specific variants. What assurances do you, um, can you give people that a couple of years from now, there won't be some type of an unintended consequence that will, um, that will arise from the vaccines? So as someone who has taken care of patients with COVID-19 and who has watched a lot of people die who should not have died, my perspective is quite different. So my answer to that question is, did you die? That's my answer. If you are still alive, if you are still able to see your friends, be with your loved ones, did you live? Then I think we did do well. 
side effects are not ideal from any any medicine. We don't know what the long term effects will be, if any. Uh, the initial data looks good, but we don't know about long term. But what I do know is alive is better than not alive. Right. And to add to that, um, again, I think it's really key, key and important to, to kind of stress this piece is that this is not new science. This is based on science that has been occurring over, over time and over years. And, and some of our other vaccines and other um, like uh, medicines, like Dr. Shipley said, that, had, that we have been given to folks um, has shown uh, limited to, uh, limited to uh, effects, long-term effects or unintended consequences. And so with that, um, they're relatively sure, but we're not 100% sure. We can't give anybody any type of 100% guarantee around any type of medications or vaccines. Um, but due to the science and due to some of the understandings, again, th these are uh, they're not putting things out there to really harm people or just test folks, but it's really just the opportunity to, again, save lives and to protect people from dying. And that's really what our key concern is right now. Certainly. We appreciate you all sharing so candidly, and I think you, you said it well. I, too, have lost friends as a result of this uh, disease, and so um, it's it's something that, that definitely touches a nerve for me. I want to share um, this last screen. You can see here in this particular um, uh, resource is the website for the COVID, the Mississippi State Department of Health COVID-19 vaccination information. We know that many people um, still prefer you know, or may have difficulty managing the website and, and are just not tech savvy whatsoever. So there is a hotline. Let me encourage you to take down this number. That number is 877-978-6453. Again, that number is 877-978-6453. Uh, you can also contact the uh, Department of, of Health um, and the vaccine scheduler that works in, in conjunction with uh, the University of Mississippi Medical Center, UMC and the Department of Health are working together for that. That website is covidvaccine.umc.edu. And then the Ad Council COVID Collaborative also has some wonderful information, some, some facts and figures and um, some very simple, uh, easy to understand tools that are easy to navigate at getvaccineanswers.org. So, um, this information can be very uh, helpful to you if that's something that you have an interest in. So I'll leave that up for just a minute. And I uh, want to take a moment to thank you all for being part of our discussion today and want to encourage you to reach out if you have any uh, questions um, or you know anything else that we can help you with uh, here at the Mind Center. So we want to thank you for your time and attention and want to thank our guests, uh, Dr. Udemba, Dr. Pierre, and Dr. Shipley for uh, giving us time this afternoon. Thank you so much, and we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe, wear your mask, sanitize, and consider the vaccine. Thank you so much. <laughs>